Welcome to this video. Module 6 includes the topic of ecosystems. So this video will begin with an introduction and some definitions that you're going to find useful for the rest of the course. I encourage you to have a look at pages 606 to 608 in your textbook. Throughout this module we're going to be looking at a range of different topics. We're going to be looking at how biomass and energy flows through the ecosystem, how materials are recycled within the ecosystem, such as through uh, nitrogen and carbon cycles, how ecosystems develop and how they're maintained. We'll also be looking at how populations change and interact with each other. And lastly, how the ecosystem can be managed in a sustainable way. Let's start by having a look at some of the terms that you're going to need to know. So on the left here, we've got a range of individual terms. We've got ecosystem, habitat, community, population, niche, biotic, and abiotic. And not, these are not the only terms you're gonna need, but they are some of the most important ones to start with. So I'm gonna give you a few moments just to have a look at the definitions here on the right. And I would like you to see if you can match up your understanding of the ones on the left to the ones on the right. So let's start with the term ecosystem. Ecosystems include all the living and non-living factors in a location. So this is an overall term. So if we refer to the living and non-living factors, we will have included everything that's important within that ecosystem. And we'll look at what we mean by those two terms shortly. Habitat. This is the natural home or environment of a species. It's a term that we often use, but perhaps don't really fully understand what it means. Community, this is the total of all the living species in a set location or an ecosystem. So we're looking at all the living things there. So that would include all the plants and all the animals, any fungi or bacteria that might be there, and obviously the protoctists, but they're not a very big group really. Population, the number of individuals of the same species within a set location. So we're only really looking at um, a defined area and within that area, we would want to know how many individuals of that species can be found. Now the next term, niche, is one that's quite difficult to understand, but it means the role of an organism within the ecosystem. So what we mean by the role of the organism, this means what they eat, where they live, how they exist, how they interact with the other organisms. The idea is that no two organisms, two different species, can occupy the same niche. They might be incredibly similar, but there will have to be some differences. Otherwise, they will be in direct competition with each other, and it's most likely that one of them will outcompete the other and become the dominant species in that ecosystem. Biotic is the living part of the ecosystem. This is everything that is alive, so that's all the plants and all the animals, the fungi and so on, and also the microbes as well that are part of that. People often forget about that part of it because they're not very visible, but those are also an essential part of the ecosystem. And lastly, this word abiotic. Abiotic is the non-living part of the ecosystem, so that's really all the other factors which contribute to the character of that ecosystem. So, for example, the amount of rainfall. If you look in your front cover of your workbook, you'll see that you've got um, ecosystems definitions. And um, you'll have a whole load of defini definitions in there which you need to find the correct word for. So see, these will be some of the words that will fit in with the definitions that you've got. So take a few moments to match up some of these with the definitions that you've got. There will be a few others, which we haven't done just yet, but we will be working through some of those as we go further on in the course. Here we have an example of a pond ecosystem. And when we look at this picture, what we can see is we can see a food chain and we can also see some of the abiotic factors as well, which are contributing to this overall system. Now, when we talk about the abiotic factors, we'll be looking here at the sun, we'll be looking at the minerals, for example, that might be dissolving in the water around it. We can see that we've got uh, plants that are growing the producers, which are the 
um, and the algae and so on that might be living in the water. What we also need to bear in mind here is this pond ecosystem is relatively self-contained in the sense that quite a lot of the organisms that live in this pond really do rely upon the organisms that purely live there. But um, there are going to be other organisms which may not spend all their time in the pond. So for example we can see that dragonfly there. So the dragonfly nymphs of course live in the pond as when they are um, immature and not adults but the adults obviously don't spend all their time there and um, we'd also get things like frogs which will spend part of their life cycle in the pond and some of the time living on the land. So we do have organisms which actually spend part of their ex existence in the pond and part of their existence elsewhere. Um, it's also worth remembering that each ecosystem is not isolated from another. So we might have a pond ecosystem, but we would also have, for example, um, a, a woodland ecosystem that might be nearby, and the organisms from that woodland ecosystem will be interacting with the pond one. So a lot of the ecosystems are actually overlapping, and they're not necessarily totally finite from each other. Here's another example of an ecosystem in a woodland and we can see here we've got a tree and we've got lots of organisms that are living on the tree. The tree obviously is the producer and there will be insects and uh, birds and so on that will be living in the tree and it's also worth remembering and it's an area that's most often forgotten about but the tree is partly existing in the air and partly existing in the soil and the soil actually is a very important ecosystem. It has lots of um, insects and worms and microbes and fungi that play an important part in uh, the life cycle of the tree. So in fact what we can see here is that ecosystems are not always what we can see visibly. They can be underground, they can be microscopic. So we need to remember that there's more than just the, the visible surface when you look at an ecosystem. And for example those birds will be part of this ecosystem but also be part of other ecosystems as well for example like the pond or lake along those lines and uh, maybe a, a, um, a grassland ecosystem as well so there's a lot of um, overlap between one and the other. One of the first things we talked about was our definition of ecosystem and we referred to the fact that we this includes the living and the non-living part of the ecosystem. So the non-living part are the abiotic factors and the abiotic factors include a whole list that are just visible now, just put them up on the, on the uh, screen. So you can see these include temperature, light, water, oxygen, the soil pH, salinity if we're looking at um, water, organic content which is referred to as, as uh, humus which is not the same as the stuff you buy in uh, the shop for, uh, to have your with your breadsticks. And we've got wind and water currents as well, which also play a part. Now this is not a totally definitive list, but um, it, it covers the majority of the abiotic factors. So these are all contributing to the character of that ecosystem. And it's worth remembering that one factor could have quite a big effect upon the others. So I just have a think for a moment about um, what sort of other abiotic factors might influence the temperature. So while you're thinking about that, the sorts of things we might consider that would affect the temperature might be, for example, the, uh, the uh, light levels around, even the humidity in the air, those kind of things could make a difference. Um, if we've got currents of water, still water might become warmer than um, water which is which is constantly moving. So a lot, lot of things could actually have an influence upon those two things. Looking at the biotic section of the ecosystem, this includes things like the food supply, predation, disease, all the other living organisms that are there. Now some of these might lead to disease. When we talk about food supply, that's quite often going to be the, the uh, producers, but it could be other animals. And also, of course, the things that are eating those animals, so what you're, what you're likely to be predated by. And of course, disease includes things like bacteria and fungi and so on. So these are all the living parts of the ecosystem and they, they all interact with each other. And of course, the main thing we can say here is the biotic and the abiotic factors are completely linked to each other. So the food supply, which might be the, the, um, 
quantity of producers that we've got are going to be directly linked to the temperature of their environment, the amount of light that we've got, whether there's a, a, a good availability of water and so on. So those things will directly influence that and obviously all the other things as well will be um, inter interlinked with each other. So in your workbook on page one I want you to complete the table measuring abiotic factors. We're probably going to need to do some research um, because what, one of the things that you need to do is work out the sorts of equipment that you could do to measure some of these abiotic factors. So have a look through, look things up, you can obviously go online and see what you can find there and look in your textbook as well, so complete that table. The whole point of this is so that if you were asked to describe um, an investigation where you had to investigate one of these abiotic factors, you'd have some idea how to go about it. The next task, also on page one, is to look at four different organisms, a limpet, cactus, polar bear and a Venus flytrap. And I want you just to look at the abiotic factors and think about which three are likely to have some of the biggest influences upon their survival. So those are two tasks for you that you'd be getting on with. The next task in your workbook is on page two. And what I would like you to do for this is have a look at each of these abiotic factors and think of an organism which is going to be significantly affected by it. You have a table on page two with um, the, all these different abiotic factors and what we want you to do is just try to think of an organism which perhaps might be particularly affected by each of those. The next thing I want to consider is why we describe ecosystems as being dynamic. Now this is a term that's always used to describe ecosystems. Now dynamic itself means that something is moving all the time. So in most ecosystems, population sizes are going to rise and fall. They don't stay the same, and this is partly to do with the way that populations interact with each other, either predating each other or providing food. Members of the community interact with each other and their physical environment. So the population might fall because, for example, it might, you, might, you might have had a particularly harsh winter and the animals may not have survived the, um, the, the cold weather, for example. One ecosystem is going to blend into another. And so as an ecosystem interacts with another ecosystem, it could influence how the numbers of the living things are actually going to be affected. And also it could just be that um, the, uh, the way an ecosystem interacts with another could be the abiotic factors. So for example, the sea might interact with um, something like a, a salt marsh and it might uh, change the nature of that salt marsh depending upon how much the sea is actually um, overlapping onto that. Abiotic factors can change, so temperatures can go up and down, these can also therefore affect the populations around them and um, water levels can change, we could have a, a change in oxygen levels in a pond and that could influence whether organisms are able to survive in that pond. So overall there's constant change and adjustments going on and that's what this means when we're talking about the ecosystem being dynamic. Having a look at this um, little graph here we can see we've got rabbit and fox. It's a the very very classic example of populations. The population of the rabbit is influenced by the population of the fox and vice versa. So the question you have here is how will the rise of the rabbit population affect the fox, fox population? And then what would happen after that. So clearly what we can see if we look at this graph that the rabbit population is rising and then with a little bit of a time lag we can see that the fox population starts to rise and of course this is really due to the predator-prey relationship whereby the increase in the number of rabbits means that there's more food for the foxes the therefore they're easier to catch the fox population is going to increase because there's more food to feed their offspring and so on. And gradually, as the fox population increases, they will predate the rabbits more, so the rabbits will start to decline in number. And then that decline in number will then have an effect upon the foxes. So you're always going to see that um, the predator population is always going to lag behind what the prey is doing. But the two are intimately interlinked with each other. The last thing I want to mention is this word biomes. It's not a phrase we see very often, but biomes are a collection of ecosystems which share climate 
and, um, and they produce a very similar habitat type. So tropical forests, for example, savanna, desert, tundra, all have their own biomes. And within each of these examples, what we can see is we're going to see lots of different ecosystems within these biomes, which will have similar features to each other. And they can cover large areas a whole continents, for example, can be covered, for example, by a tropical rainforest. And within that tropical rainforest, you will have large numbers of different types of ecosystems. But they're all very overlapping with similar features. This map shows quite nicely some of the biomes that you would see in the, in the world. And um, you can see here, for example, if we just concentrate on the desert one, the desert biome covers a huge area across the Earth and um, and within that biome there will be different ecosystems and those ecosystems will overlap with each other but of course they are ecosystems experiencing very similar conditions and climate and um, but obviously not exactly the same so there will be some areas for example where there is a larger proportion of water so you'll see greater numbers of plants there so you might see a, a more of an oasis going on and other areas which are much drier so you'd see a lot less in the way of uh, plant life growing there. So just have a quick look at this because it's quite useful to see um, how the biomes are sort of distributed around the world. Now this brings us to the end of this first uh, video so um, I, I hope this has been useful for you and we're going to be going on to the next one which is how biomass transfers through the ecosystem.